<laughs> but I also did see where, you know, he may have to bring uh, Sandy Alderson back. Right. Uh, because of uh, his, the respect that all the owners have for Sandy. And I think we as Met fans all have uh, respect for Sandy as well. At least I know I'd I love do. that. I know. I'd love that. Yeah. Well, you In got any sort of role, right. any sort of role, that would be spectacular. And that might mean, though, too, in in reading uh, in the post this morning with uh, Joel Sherman, who's been all over this, is that Brody might say, all right, enough of this. We're always talking about Brody getting fired, but Brody, because he's going to have to answer to somebody and he doesn't have that direct line to Jeff Wilpon where he could text him any point of the day and say, hey, Jeff, this is what I'm doing, which attracted him to the job. He might just leave on his own when he thinks that his job is in peril anyway. So it just seems like the writing is on the wall for Brody. You know, the amazing thing is, is uh, for Sandy Alderson, obviously has dealt with cancer, has basically disappeared, hasn't said one word about anything that the Mets have done, didn't leave like angry, didn't leave any, you know, dust in his wake or any of sure. that stuff. You know why? Because he's a class guy and he, he knows how to – you know, to carry himself professionally, and that's what the Mets were underneath him. I'm, you know, look, all I know is I, I don't miss a Jacob DeGrom start, you know, I, and I get disappointed when he doesn't make it through a start, when he has the, you know, the hamstring uh, spasms last week and all this other stuff. And then you watch the brilliance of Jacob DeGrom last night. I was listening to Ronnie and Keith, and especially Ronnie when just the, the way he just goes about his business and how professional he is and, and what a great superstar he truly is i mean i, I don't necessarily know I, we know it because we see it and because he's already won two cy youngs but like last night you know 14 k's another wasted effort by the mets they can't get him a freaking win they can't get a hit off of six different freaking pitchers from tampa and it's you know it's just it's unbelievable how great this guy really really is i mean if i were 10 years old i would think that this is tom siever all over again uh, you know, yeah. this is this is how good he is. And we should never take his uh, his efforts for granted. We shouldn't take his personality for granted. He's so unassuming and so great. It's like the pers the perfect personality uh, for New York, New York sports fans. You know, whatever criticism may have come his way, you know, prior to all the you know success he's had in the last three years. But again, last night in the seventh inning, Ronnie Darling, 100 miles an hour. You know, I mean, 14 Ks. Uh, he was he was amazing. And yeah, I mean, he had one inning where he struck out the side on 10 pitches, yeah, I, which is just almost amazing. impossible. He's amazing. Yeah. I don't, he's probably not going to win the Cy Young as his, uh, his ERA, as Gary pointed out last night. His ERA went up a little bit. Uh, it's too bad that, you know, the previous start he gave up those three earned runs and then had to take himself out of the game. But I, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. This, this guy is the I don't care. He consistently the best pitcher in baseball. And, you know, maybe for one year he won't win it in the National League. Uh, you know, maybe somebody else uh, will have a better uh, win-loss record. Somebody else may have a lower ERA, but nobody's going to have more strikeouts. He's got one more start to go before the season's over. And, you know, he gave us, again, what we want from all of our athletes, just an unassuming great effort pretty much every time he goes out on the field. That's what you want. You want a guy that cares. Now, here's the one thing I will say, G, uh, you know, from, from a – standpoint of an athlete that would play in full stadiums whether it be in college or whether it be in the pros you do get a a jolt of adrenaline when you step on the field in front of the fans and some teams can do it and some teams can't the nba and the nhl have been playing in bubbles without fans for over 60 days and these players somehow especially the players that have gotten to the end here have manufactured the, the intensity that is required to win those games and it's a little bit easier to do it when you're doing it in the playoffs than it is, say, during the regular season, like uh, Major League Baseball is doing it right now and the National Football League is doing it right now. But the teams that are going to win are the teams that are going to be able to manufacture that excitement, that intensity, you know, that, that kind of like looking forward to playing the game that you're playing. And this is the problem that the freaking Jets have. They have a flatlining head coach. They have a flatlining quarterback. And they don't bring any – and there's not one person that brings any energy to the field when they show up on Sunday. Somebody has to show some energy. Now, when you look at the Giants, I think Joe Judge is the guy who shows the energy, who probably behind the scenes is, you know, ripping guys and patting guys on the back and getting them going. He's 38 years old. He's got, you know, he's got hunger. He, he knows that he's got a job that nobody expected him to have. And I think he brings the energy. Uh, the Jets have nobody that brings the energy. The Mets had energy, but they don't have pitchers. 
So they have another, they have a, a different set of uh, circumstances. And the thing about the Yankees, even though they got shelled last night, and, you know, let's face it, you know, they're throwing the guys out there that they've thrown out there last night on the mound, not going to help anything. But, you know, they, they have culture. They have expectations. They have the pinstripes. And, uh, you know, some of these teams around here are just dead. And it's like the, the Jets are dead. The more I think about it, <laughs> the more I think oh, that there is finally just, come around. Well, Folks, no, there but the is. point and the there reason is. I say this is because I listened to the players. Uh, you know, Marty Lyons interviewed Griffin, the tight end and 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 McDougal, of course, safety. And they're talking about practice and how practices, you know, they, they haven't really had great competitive practices. And those are two guys who were recently in other organizations, uh, especially Bradley McDougal, who came from the Seahawks in the Jamal Adams trade. Ryan Griffin has been here for a little bit, but he was with uh, the Houston Texans prior to coming over here right, I'm gonna, uh, last I, I, year. Right. I'm going to I'm going to uh, just uh, again, I'm just going to go back one more time to my career. At the end of my career, when I was the backup quarterback, I was not the starting quarterback. So it wasn't my place to talk to the team. It wasn't my place. Uh, to be the leader of the team. Jeff Blake was, actually. He was the starting quarterback. And our team, I think, if I remember correctly, we were getting off to like a one-and-four start or something, and we, we were just kind of a general malaise. And there's an acceptance of losing. And we had a good young team. The, the Bengals really drafted well. Corey Dillon was on that team his rookie year. He wasn't playing at that time. But it was a good young team. And I was running scout team. And I remember Bruce Coslett, who was the head coach there at the time, said to me, he goes, look, man, you got to do something in, uh, in practice. You, you, you have to do it. I'm like, I have to do it? I'm not even playing. He says, well, yeah, but you're running the scout team. I said, okay, what would you like me to do? He goes, he goes, challenge the defense any way you want to challenge them. I don't care how you do it, just do it. So I got in the huddle, and I told the, uh, the offensive linemen, they're usually the backup offensive linemen, the young guys, the guys that were on the practice squad and things of that nature. I said, look, guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go 100 miles an hour. We were going to get through this period. They got it scheduled for 15 minutes. They got us running 10 scout plays, and we're going to get through this thing in less than five minutes. We are going to go, and we're going to go 100 miles an hour. And on the way back to the huddle, I want you guys to, you know, shove a defensive guy in the back, push him in the helmet, do whatever you do. Just don't go near their knees, obviously. And let's just see if we can antagonize them into competing in practice. And I'll never forget, Dick LeBeau was our, uh, our uh, defense coordinator at the time. And Dick LeBeau is one of the great coaches, one of the great people the NFL has ever seen. And uh, he and I got into an argument over the way that I was running the, the scout team. And I don't necessarily know that he knew that Bruce had asked me to go out there and to try to, you know, fire up the team in some way that I possibly could. So it was an argument. And it, it was and it would and it would go on for weeks and weeks and weeks. But you know what? We got better. We got better because we practiced harder. We pushed each other. We push, pushed each other. And, you know, and that you play how you practice. I don't care what anybody says. Now, some days you're going to have some weeks you have great practices. And you may fall flat in your face on Sunday because the other team's going to be better. But you got to you. These teams have got to manufacture the intensity. And I and so I was telling looking, me Joe Flacco now has to no, figure out a way. I love Joe Flacco. I love Joe Flacco. That guy's as flat line as right. there's ever been in the NFL. Right. I love I, I love and respect Joe Flacco. Don't get me wrong, but he's not the guy that's going to do this. And it's one of the reasons why John Harbaugh said, you know what? I got lightning, and lightning is Lamar Jackson, and lightning sure. will light up my entire team. Because that's what he is. That's what Kyler Murray is. That's what uh, Russell Wilson is. That's what Patrick Mahomes is. That's what Aaron Rodgers is. That's what, you know, all these top-end quarterbacks are. They are the juice. Now, last night, in last night's game, the juice really came from the fact that Allegiant Stadium was being open. The Death Star was being open for the Raiders. So the Raiders had all the emotion last night. And they played with it, and they won. So somehow, the Jets have got to manufacture emotion yeah. On the road in Indianapolis, it's not going to be easy for them. And then they come home Thursday night against the uh, the Broncos. And I watched uh, – so at CBS, we have all the pregame cameras out there. So we could see all the stuff that's happening before the game. All right? And watching the 49ers on the sideline, they're hooting and hollering. They're bouncing around. They're, they're going 100 miles an hour. They're screaming and yelling. Then you look at the Jets – and everybody's just walking around, going through their motions, and there's no freaking emotion. None. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a couple things that pop into my mind. Now, the Jamal Adams stuff for me and you was this guy was a pain in the ass. He didn't want to be here. He forced himself out. 100%. But that's, that's me and you. The locker room maybe doesn't see it that way. The locker room, they see 
their captain, MVP, guy who did bring the energy, leader of the team, gets so disgusted with his situation, contractually and also with the head coach that he went publicly, that he forced himself out. And that, I think, can permeate through the locker room where they don't trust the head coach, and they're going to love Jamal Adams more than they're going to love the coaching staff. And I think that taking the heart and soul out of that team, and I think you had to trade him, and I think especially with what they got back, you had to trade him. And I'm not trying to do revisionist history, but I do think that that affects the locker room. That's a major, major thing. And right now, if you go candidly to every one of those players, on the Jets and say, do you believe that Adam Gase is the guy that is going to be the head coach for the Jets when they make it back to the playoffs again? I bet you they'd probably say no. Remember what Jamal Adams said when he was trying to get out. He said, I don't believe that Adam Gase is the guy who's going to take us to the promised land. Now, we see that when he goes to Manish and says that stuff as he's doing everything that he can to get traded. But how do the players in the locker room hear that? Do they see it like we see it, or do they believe him? Because they've stood shoulder to shoulder with well, them, and that's the guy that they looked up to. They're 0-2 right now, and they have flatlined in two games. So it's easy now to look back on Jamal Adams and Manish and all this other crap and say, yeah, that's true. And I, and I do believe that there, there has to be a manufactured energy somewhere. There has to be life from somebody on this team. But I also know that this team's in the middle of a rebuild. And when you do let somebody like Jamal Adams go, it's going to be significant in that locker room from a standpoint of the emotion. But... You didn't see a lot of guys wishing Jamal Adams the best. You know, it wasn't like he was the most popular guy in publicly, that locker room. I'm telling you. I'm publicly? No, dude, dude, I'm telling you. He, well, you know. I mean, do we know, have we looked at all their texts? I mean, plus the stuff that they wanted to say, they probably couldn't say publicly. They probably like, oh, like, they like, couldn't like, say Good right. for you, man. Like, good for you. You got the hell out of here. I mean, that's awesome. You well, went to the Seahawks, and now I'm say, stuck hey, in this luck. hellhole. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I, I think Marcus May sent, you know, did something publicly like, hey, man, go get yours or something like that. And it was somewhat of a support because, you know, obviously – playing the same position and I, I don't is... follow like any jets on social media so i can't tell you if they wished him well or not plus the stuff that that they say or they text or they go back and forth to one another they don't necessarily put out there for everybody to see but yeah I mean, the other the other point too is is that you know i i want to get traded or you're going to pay me and now he goes to play seattle and he doesn't expect them to pay him right pay him right now i mean like he you know, was so in like, the wrong i know i don't want to I mean, go back to that my point is though the way we see it and the way the players in the locker room see it could be two different things it could and adam gase hasn't given them much reason to believe either and and jamal adams the stuff here's another part of this the stuff that we heard from him publicly it was probably 50 times worse to the people that mm. he was playing with and his teammates i'm uh, sure uh, I got to get the hell out of here. I can't stand it. I can't wait. You know, and he's he probably texting him, him out. It's to awesome Dallas, to be dude. here. He tried to yeah, get okay, himself fine. to this. But, I, but, but that I, stuff but has I, reverberations, but, man. Yeah, it does. I, I do agree that he, he was the energy. There's no question. And there's nobody to replace that energy right now. I don't know what the hell. You know, maybe it should be Greg Williams. I The thing about it is, uh, you know, or maybe it's Joe Vitt or somebody like that on the staff. <laughs> Jesus, Joe God. Vitt. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, because like, it's not Adam <laughs> Gase. Yeah. You know, and Adam yeah. Gase, that, look. Adam Gase right now is basically in a spot that Mike McCagnan's been in, that Todd Bowles has been in, that John Idzik has been in. Uh, you know, you know who would be a great head coach under the, these circumstances right now? Rex Ryan. Yes, one hundred percent. He'd be a maniac on the field. Same old Jets. Yeah, well, he would be a maniac on the field. He would be energy personified on the sideline, whether you like him or not. You know, Jet fans cannot dispute the fact that he got him to two AFC championship games and basically, uh, you know, was just the personality plus. He was. Hey, this Rex Ryan. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, that's. And I'm, look, Rex is crazy, but he actually, under these circumstances, without fans, would, would be a, would at least have a heartbeat, for God's sake. Time has treated the Rex Ryan era well. That is for sure. There's no doubt about it. Everybody looks back at that so nostalgically. They were fun. They were entertaining. They won. They gave you something to talk about. It has never been the same since. How, it hasn't. He he basically won with a quarterback that I, I don't know what happened to Mark Sanchez. I, you could sit here and say the Jets ruined him or whatever. But Mark Sanchez was the quarterback of a team that went to two AFC championship games. Yep. And you can say whatever you want uh, about, you know, his overall play and whether or not he was ever going to be uh, reflective of where he was drafted. I, you know, that's a whole different thing. And he became skittish 
and, you know, had the butt fumble and all that other stuff. And then, you know, but I, he would be the perfect guy right now. You know, he would be the guy that would be screaming and yelling on the sideline, hooping and hollering in the locker room, telling the Jets how great they are. And the Jets would go out and reflect his personality. If, uh, really beautiful feet. Yeah, I, well, that's good, too. <laughs> but I, I just think that uh, Adam Gase has got to, like, you better realize, look, man, I don't care. See, Adam Gase to me right now is under fire, and rightfully so, because of the way the team looks. It looks lethargic. It looks discombobulated. It looks like it, it's it's not like the worst team in football. And you have period. a number of players that are coming out saying that your your practice habits are not great. That is not good. That's not a good sign. And those guys said it kind of innocently. I like they were. I think they were saying it blaming themselves as as opposed to blaming the coach. But Joe Judge started practice over. You know, he started practice over. And that was a big deal. And Saquon Barkley said, yeah, we needed to start practice over. And he did the same thing at halftime of the Chicago Bear game. He said, boys, we're starting over because that first half was unacceptable. So that's a culture thing. That's kind of a learned behavior. And he brings energy to the New York Giants. At least right now he does. Yeah, but the, the- he- but to me, Adam Gase is doomed because there's nothing he can do but win, and he can't win with this team. I'm sorry. He, unless Joe Douglas and Christopher Johnson have decided that no matter how this year goes, Adam Gase is coming back next year, then he is doomed because he, even if everything that you want changes around and that energy is there, they're not going to win. They're just not. And then maybe there's a couple of games here or there like they look inspired. But the losing is going to mount. They're going to end up being the worst team in football. The yelling is going to mount. The Trevor Lawrence stuff is going to mount. It's just going to spiral out of control. I just think I just think that, you know, Joe Judge is a no-nonsense, no BS guy. He's a young guy. He's got energy. It's his first job. And he's going to do everything he can to get it right and hold on to it and keep the team playing hard. On the other side, I see a guy that looks like he's looking for his next job already. You know, he's got his contact. I mean, hey, look, he's got. Well, I'm not talking about his next job as a head coach. Yeah, yeah, I'm (laughs) not talking about his head coach. I'm talking about if he doesn't get this thing straightened out. And, you know, this would be me if I were his boss telling him this. If you don't get this freaking thing straightened out, you know, you're going to end up looking for another job somewhere else. I mean, these these you got to get these guys lit up. And if they're not going to be lit up and they're not going to go out and play like they give a damn, then guess what? It's a reflection, unfortunately, on the head coach. And I, I, don't, I don't know what else to tell you. I don't, I don't want to you know, advocate firing anybody right now. I'm not doing that. It's two weeks into the season. But there is a crisis management moment right now. Same old Jets. For the New York Jets because of that sediment right there. So do you now think that there is a chance that he gets fired during the season? I still don't. I think it'll be at the end of the year. I don't think he'll get you fired. You know what? I, I think it all depends on how this team looks. I, I would think if, you know. Week six or seven, they're zero and six, zero and seven, and they still look lethargic, and there's no energy, and there's no nothing. You can't I mean, go Joe from Douglas, genius Joe, Joe, to fired in three weeks, four weeks. You I know, know what I, I'm well, look, I, you know, look, I understand that Christopher Johnson. That? I understand that Christopher Johnson wants to support his uh, coach, and he wants to try to tap down some of the criticism. I know that. I, I look, I'm trying to explain what I think is the problem here. Okay, yeah. not, they're not great players here, and what players are being counted on, especially on offense significantly, are hurt. Um, but it's a process that you have to go through in order order to get on the other side of it. Um, but I I just, when I went back and looked at the tapes, and, and, uh, and, I, and I go back again to the beginning of last game between the uh, 49ers and the, uh, the Jets, the 49ers were ready to go coming out of that locker room, man. And you could see it on the sideline in the pregame uh, uh, video and all that stuff. And the Jets were just standing around. I don't know. And then all of a sudden, 80 yards later, they're in the end zone, the 49ers. Well, well di- didn't we say going into this game that we would know everything we needed to know about this group in this game? Not from the win-loss standpoint, but how they looked. Because yes. it was as miserable a week one experience as you could have. So much so that I have never seen in any sport after one week of a regular season there be a vote of confidence from the owner to the coach and the quarterback. You know what and it is? They it's, didn't come out with inspiration and pride and guts and all these things we talked about. If they didn't come out, then we knew how bad they were. You want to know what and, it is? It's, it's, time, yard touchdown it's time to make people uncomfortable. It's time to, you know, start bringing in guys, uh, start checking out guys, uh, you know, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays having workouts. Uh, it, it, it is time to start making people feel like, you know, hey, the check may not be in the mail next week. 
You know, either you get your ass in gear or you're not going to be here. And I, you know, that really, I'm telling you, it comes down to the head coach and, and how he communicates. And it's easy for me to sit, sit here behind this microphone and, and say all these things. Uh, but I, I often think, and I know you had this, and, and I, I hate to compare this to high school because when we were high school kids, <laughs> we're, we, we'd, we'd run through a wall for our football coaches. I love comparing <clears throat> my high school career to the NFL. It's yeah, one of my no, favorite things But today. the point being is, is that we loved our coaches. Did we not? Yeah, yeah, sure. And Great. did our yes. coaches give the most unbelievable pregame speeches or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I always admired the fact that these guys who, who were much older than us at the time could find the right things to fire up the teenagers. You know, I mean, that that was the thing. Uh, it was it was amazing, right? Because that's not an easy thing to do. We spent our entire day not listening to teachers and hall monitors and everything and adults. But yet when we were in that room, we were captivated by the man standing in front of us. And that really was the skill. And you wanted to make sure that you held up your end of the bargain. But a lot of that had to do with the culture stuff, too, though. That's the thing. Well, we both had culture in high school. We both had our high school coaches who built major traditions at their respective right. high schools. You'd walk you'd walk in the gym. You'd look up. You'd see the banners. The highlight films would be played. Like, you're the next in line for this stuff. I mean, there's certain organizations, certain programs that never had that. You know, so that that's the thing. It's like when you put on – this is what we always talk about with the Yankees and Mets. It's like when you put on that uniform, like what does it mean? And right now putting on a Jets uniform doesn't mean much. We're all so. just little beings on the pimple of the ass of the universe. Yeah, the Jerry Locker Room speech would be a great one. Like win, lose, doesn't matter. You're going to you, turn to dust eventually. Did you not want to just go running through a wall after the pregame speech? Sure, yeah. I mean, I would, I would run out there, and I, I mean, I would man that sideline with such fervor. You had no idea. <laughs> I kept my uniform so clean. No, of course. I, I would, though. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was a lot of times where he was even during practice. And you'd go out there and you'd want that something would be said that would fire you up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a skill. It's a skill that some people can tap into and some people possess. And there are others. those that will leave a mark, but many of us will not. <laughs> I love Jerry standing up in front. Of, he's got to talk to the Rutgers football team. Now here's the uh, basketball play-by-play -play man, Jerry Recco. As time uh, goes on, we're forgotten. <laughs> so go out there and beat Nebraska. Uh, yeah, but uh, Adam Gase does not have that skill. That's one of the things I think Jamal Adams might have been right about and all the crap that he said was that, like, he wasn't really giving speeches. He wasn't really around the entire team. Well, that's the point. The I mean, that's, and, that's the point, you know. And, and I heard Evan and, and Joe say this yesterday, and I will give them credit for this. Uh, I am not. I am not going to take anything away from those guys. Those guys are died in the world Jet fans. They have every right to be disgusted after two just really bad performances. But you know, Adam Gase is not just an offensive coordinator. He's not just worried. He sh he can't just be worried about the quarterback. When you are the head coach, you're the head coach of everybody, and everybody has to see you as such. You know, I and, I and I wonder if that is the way it is with him. I'm like, if you convince Christopher Johnson that you're good, <clears throat> you're going to be this offensive guru, and you have all these plays and all these plans and all this stuff is going to work, uh, then it you better show itself. Uh, but then if you if it, you don't have the players to do what you want to do, you you better at least get the effort out of the players, and somehow you better stand up in front of a group of men and inspire them to play. I, you yeah. know, I, I just feel like, you know, it's just, it's a big part of, of, of the sport, the emotion of the sport. And without the fans, it's got to be really difficult for a lot of teams to really just get up to it. And as they go on, the season goes on and these teams start losing and more and more, it's going to be, be harder worse. and harder yeah. and harder for them to get up to play these games emotionally. And the other thing too, and I, I think I told you this before the season started, I was worried about two things. I was worried about injuries, yeah, and I was worried about penalties. And the injuries are already taking hold, and the penalties have not been nearly as significant as I thought they were going to be, and there's a reason for that. Because sure. the NFL put an edict out, do not call the penalties unless they are obvious. Clear and obvious. The old yes. clear and obvious. That's right. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And don't forget to hit the red bell so you're notified when we have new content.